Have you ever made a spontaneous decision without thinking through the consequences? Anybody ever done that? Made a spontaneous, maybe, maybe you got mad at work and you looked at your boss and you said, I quit, and you stormed out. And you got home and you thought, what in the world did I just do? Maybe, maybe you saw this car and you just had to purchase it. And you, you bought the car, you signed the contract without really thinking whether you could make the monthly payments or not. Maybe some of you took your girlfriend to Las Vegas and you got married. And then you thought, did I really just get married in Las Vegas? Or, or maybe you're like the guy who joined the army to impress girls and then realized he just made a four-year commitment. He didn't really think through the consequences. He didn't really count the cost. Whatever the decision you made, you didn't count the cost. Well, Jesus actually warns against making that type of spiritual decision. Believe it or not, Jesus doesn't want us to make an emotional, spontaneous decision to follow him. Now, in the passage that we're looking at today, Jesus warns his would-be followers to calculate the cost, to, to count the cost of being a disciple. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, I'm going to begin reading in verse 25. Luke 14, thank you, Vernita and, and team. That was Heather and Jen that just sang that, that wonderful song just a few moments ago. Worship's been great, by the way. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. A large crowd was following Jesus. And he turned around and said to them, now imagine Jesus is walking and and this large, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, the text text doesn't say, all of these people were following Jesus. And in one moment, Jesus turns around and he addresses this large crowd that's following him. And he makes this statement. If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, he tells them, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Verse 28, but don't begin until you count the cost for who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it. Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started to build but couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. Verse 33, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Would you read that verse with me today? That's such a strong verse. Let's read it together. It's up on the screen. Jesus says, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Lord, our our hearts have been stirred this morning. We've been reminded of the fact that without you, we're nothing. We've been reminded of the, the need to, to surrender to you. Lord, Lord, the power, the majesty of your name. And, and our prayer, Jesus, is that you have been honored and glorified. Lord, not only by the words that we sang, but even more importantly, by the attitude of our hearts. You, you have the ability to not only hear and see what's going on, but you have the ability to see deep inside 
of our hearts. Lord, you know what our struggles are. You know what our rebellions are. Lord, you know whether we really are following you or not. So we pray this morning that you would take these, your words, and remind us as to the truth of this passage. And I pray, Lord, that every single person here, Lord, would be a true, dedicated, committed follower of Jesus Christ. God, help us to understand the magnitude of what that means and help us to be willing to do it. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I, I must confess this morning that, that this passage for me is one of the most difficult passages in the entire New Testament. I've probably read this passage hundreds, if, if not a thousand or so times. I, I, I've preached on this passage over and over and over again. And yet I must confess that every time I read it, I'm convicted. Every time I read it, I realize that, man, there's a lot of work that God still needs to do in Brian's life. And every time I read it, I walk away with a greater determination to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. As we read this truth, there are several truths that are, as we read this passage, there are several truths that are instantly clear. The first is this, and let me make a couple of introductory comments before we jump into the passage. The first is this, Jesus is more interested in making disciples than gaining popularity. I want you to catch that. Jesus is much more interested in making disciples than he is in, in gaining popularity. Now, if you'll remember it, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was extremely popular. Just to give you an idea, in Luke chapter 5 and verse 15, you can look it up later, it says, vast crowds came to hear him preach. Luke chapter 12 and verse 1, it said, the crowds grew until thousands were milling around, stepping on each other. I read that and I think, wow. Can you imagine being one of the disciples that was watching the, the size of that crowd grow? I'm sure the, the, the disciples were ecstatic. You see, Jesus had become a sort of a rock star. It didn't matter where Jesus went, crowds followed him. People, people loved to hear him talk. Why? They loved the miracles. And it didn't hurt that every once in a while he turned a few loaves and a few fish into a meal big enough to feed thousands. And people thought, you know, every once in a while if we hang around Jesus, we're going to get a free meal out of this. Yet as Jesus approached his pending death, his call for commitment became stronger and stronger. And as Jesus made his way towards Jerusalem, realizing what was at, what was going to take place in Jerusalem, he raised the proverbial bar. In, in the mind of the people, Jesus' message changed. Why? In the beginning, he was talking about joy and contentment and everything that's going to happen in the kingdom of God. And all of a sudden, he begins talking not so much about contentment, but now he begins talking about commitment. Jesus raises the bar. Why is that? Well, the second thing I wrote in my notes is this. Jesus is looking for followers and not fans. You see, Jesus doesn't want you or me to just be a fan of Jesus Christ. Uh, he doesn't want us to be fair weather fans. Many people are accused of being fair weather fans of the Miami Heat. Now that they're winning, everybody's a fan of the Miami Heat. Where were all of those fans when they were losing? We have a tendency to respond the same way. As long as everything's going great in our life, Man, we are all for Jesus. Give me a J. Give me an E. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a fan of Jesus. But then trials come. And then life becomes difficult. And things happen that just don't make sense to us. And those fans begin to trickle away. 
That's what takes place in the New Testament. 20 times in the New Testament, Jesus issued a compelling, challenging, convicting invitation to follow him. He makes it crystal clear that he's not interested in just mere fans. He doesn't want enthusiastic admirers. He doesn't want people to do cheers for him. He's looking for committed followers. If you read through the New Testament, as Jesus approached his death, it said many of the people, John 6, 66, that followed him from afar ceased to follow him anymore. So, so in today's passage, Jesus addresses his comments to those who claimed that they were following him, but their life did not back up their profession. They said that they were followers of Jesus, but, but their life told a completely different story. They love the miracles. They love the parables. They love the food. But they really weren't followers of Jesus. So, so let me ask you this morning. Are you a follower of Jesus? Or are you a fan of Jesus? Does your life back up your profession? Are you interested in, the, in experiencing the blessings of knowing Christ, but not really interested in making a commitment? So I just asked, are you a fan or a follower? In these verses, Jesus is calling us out. That's exactly what he's doing in these verses. He's calling not only the crowd that was listening to him, but he's calling us out. He's calling us to discipleship. And so we ask the question this morning, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Jesus gives three conditions in this passage. Let me mention them today. They're in your notes. The first is this. Jesus says, you must love me, you must love Jesus more than anyone else. Notice verse 26, notice how Jesus says it. Jesus says it this way, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. If you have a more modern translation, sometimes they try to water that down and they say, uh, you must sacrifice your love for other people. But the word in the original language is the word hate. And Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else, father, father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. I read that, and I've read that over and over and over again in my life, and I still read that, and my thought is, wow, <laughs> that's, that's harsh. Wow, that's, that's tough. This verse has caused great despair and confusion in the minds and hearts of believers for centuries. What in the world is Jesus saying? Does he, is he really telling us that we should hate our loved ones? And let me just pause for a second and say, no, that's not what he's saying. He doesn't give husbands the freedom to mistreat your wives. He doesn't give kids the freedom to hate and rebel against your parents. He doesn't give us the freedom to not like each other. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus uses the term hate as a comparative term. Jesus is speaking in what we would refer to as hyperbole. He's using exaggeration for effect. Let me, let me illustrate what I mean this morning, all right? I have, I have here cauliflower, cauliflower and chocolate. How many of you are cauliflower fans today? Anybody cauliflower fans? Okay, that's about 10 of you. How many are chocolate fans today? I think that's everybody in the auditorium, all right? I can eat cauliflower, all right? I, I can eat it. it it's got to be in something. Uh, I don't like it. Should I have opened it, Vicki? She's saying don't open it because she wants to take it home. My wife loves cauliflower, by the way. So I won't open it. You can take it home and you can use it, all right? All right, I, I can eat cauliflower. If it's in a salad, I like it better cooked than I do raw. I'm not a fan of cauliflower. But I, but I can eat cauliflower. But let me say this. I really like chocolates. 
I really, by the way, these chocolates are from the school and they're on sale in the back at the conclusion of the service. All right, we're going to sell these chocolates. All right, all right, all right. I love chocolate. Now, I, I, I can eat cauliflower, but I love chocolate. And so I might say that, that my love for chocolate is so great that my like for cauliflower is kind of like hates. Does that make sense? If you asked me, Brian, would you rather have a plate of cauliflower or a plate of chocolate? Ten times out of ten, I'm going to tell you I want a plate of chocolate. Why? I love cauliflower. I kind of like, or excuse me, I love, I misled that wrong, didn't I? Man, alive. If you're going to give me something, give me chocolate. Don't give me cauliflower, right? I love chocolates a lot more than I like cauliflower. That's, that's the idea that Jesus is using in the passage. He's using the term hate as a comparative term. And Jesus is saying this. He's saying that you must love Jesus more than you love your family. Catch that. That is such an important truth today. You must love Jesus more than you love your family. Matthew takes this and, uh, and says it just a little bit of a different way. Matthew says it this way in Matthew 10, 37. If you love your father more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love your son or daughter more than me, then you are not worthy of me. Here's the key. The key is not loving your family less. That's not the key. The key is loving your God more. As difficult as that is, the next thought, though, is even tougher because Jesus says not only should you hate or, or love Jesus more than your family, but he says you must love Jesus more than yourself. Why in the verse he says, yes, you must hate even your own life. Hey, hey, listen, the average American has a love affair with himself or herself. We admire ourselves. Hey, admit it, you looked at yourself before you left today and you said, if you're a guy, you said, you handsome devil. And, and ladies, you looked at yourself and you said, man, you are absolutely beautiful today. Admit it, we love ourselves. We pamper ourselves. Over and over again, we're told in our society, you deserve it. If you don't take care of yourself, who will take care of you? That egocentric mindset has affected, though, our relationship with Jesus. Because we become more important than him. You said, Brian, that's not true. It is, because it becomes about our likes, our dislikes. It becomes about our comforts. It becomes about what we want and what satisfies us. It becomes about us more than it is about him. Jesus uses the term hate as a comparative term. Here's the idea that Jesus is saying. You must love me more than you love anyone else else would you stop right now and just do a little bit of an inventory is there anybody in your life that you love more than Jesus think about that I know hey I'm absolutely in love with my wife Vicki and I are about to celebrate 30 years and I love Vicki I love her more today than 30 years ago when we got married I love my kids Amber our life revolves around Amber Man, we love Amber. That, that little granddaughter we just met, man, do I love Isabella. I love her. But if I love any of them more than I love Jesus, Jesus says, you are not worthy to be my disciple. Jesus wants us to love him more than we love anyone else. Jesus uses the term hate to show that everything else must come in second to him. As I just mentioned, I don't mean to be repetitive, as much as I love my wife, she can't be as important as Jesus. As much as I love my kids, 
They're not as important as Jesus. And sometimes parents, we have a tendency to elevate our kids, their wants, what they want to do above our relationship and even worse, their relationship with the Lord. We have to be very careful of that. As much as I love my job, it's not as important as Jesus. As as much as I love my car, it's not as important as Jesus. Nothing should be as important as him. Jesus said to be my disciple, you must love me more than you love anyone or anything else. Can you say that today? He says a second thing. Boy, that's, that's rough right there. And if we ended the message there, we'd say, man, that's tough. Well, it gets tougher. In verse 27, he says, you know what? If you want to be my disciple, the second thing is this. You must be willing to carry your cross. No, notice verse 27. Let's see how Jesus says it. Jesus says, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, You cannot be my disciple. Now, let's not misunderstand. Jesus is not talking about wearing a cross around your neck. We might sit back and say, hey, I got it covered. Got a cross around my neck. I'm carrying my cross. I'm a Christian. That's not what Jesus is speaking about. Often we say that this phrase speaks about hardships that we face. And I've literally had people tell me, man, Pastor Brian, pray for me. I got an ingrown toenail. Don't worry. I'm carrying my cross. (laughs) I'm carrying my cross. That ingrown toenail is the cross, is the cross that I'm carrying. Hey, Brian, I got a difficult boss. I'm carrying my cross. That's not what Jesus is talking about in the passage. When Jesus talks about carrying your cross, carrying your cross represents a public demonstration of faith. Carrying your cross represents a public demonstration of faith. Although crucifixion existed before New Testament times, the Romans were the ones that perfected it. We'll talk about that a little more as we get closer to Easter. But Romans would often have the criminal carry his or her own cross to the crucifixion site. If you were a condemned criminal, they would would build your cross They would hand you your cross, and you would be required to carry your own cross to the crucifixion site. Why was that? Carrying your cross as you went through the streets. And by the way, Jesus carried his cross. We sing that song, the Via Dolorosa. Jesus carried his cross part of the way. Part of carrying the cross demonstrated to everyone that you were guilty. It was a... It was a public demonstration that the Roman government was right, that that you were convicted and and publicly by carrying the cross, you you were demonstrating your guilt to everyone. Likewise, a believer carrying the cross means to publicly declare your faith. Hey, let me ask you today. What would happen if every believer, the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're saved here at Hollywood Community Church, and we'd say, Dennis, God bless you, you're saved, here's your cross, and you now had to carry that cross to work, you you had to carry that cross to ball games, when you went to the store, you had to carry that cross, that cross being a public demonstration of the fact that you are a believer. How many of us would want to carry that cross? Well, number one, we wouldn't want to carry it because it's heavy. (laughs) Number two, we wouldn't want to carry it because we don't want to be telling everybody everywhere that we're a believer. And carrying the cross would be a public demonstration of the fact that I am a believer. That's what Jesus is saying. You know, in our day and age, we can be secret Christians. And I'd venture to say that some of your friends, some of your co-workers, don't even know that you are a Christian. Jesus says, you know what, if you're going to follow me, you must be willing to carry your cross. You must be willing to make a public demonstration of your faith. But carrying the cross 
represented a, sing, a second thing. It represented a personal determination of commitments. You see, as I mentioned, to, to us, the cross is a beautiful symbol. We have, we have cross jewelry. We have cross decorations. We, we love the cross. We say, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross. But let us never forget that the people of Jesus' day, the cross was a means of humiliation. The people who were crucified were humiliated publicly for the most part before they crucified them they stripped them naked they stood before everyone naked they were humiliated in front of everyone only the worst of people were hung on a cross Paul says it this way in Galatians 3.13, but Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in scriptures, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The cross was a means of humiliation, but the cross was a means of execution as well. You see, if you were carrying your cross, that meant that you weren't about to live much longer. If you were carrying your cross, whenever you reached your destination, you would be crucified and you would die. Let me ask you today, what if becoming a Christian meant hardship? What if it meant persecution? What if it meant death would you still be a follower of jesus christ but listen in the united states it's so easy to become a christian we can just name ourselves christians and start attending with other believers there's no persecution there's no hardship there's no fear of death and thank god for that i'm not minimizing that thank god for that but what if you lived in another country that trusting jesus christ as your personal savior meant that your family would reject you it meant that your boss would fire you it meant that you run the risk of being severely persecuted, if not dying for your faith. Would you still be willing to be a follower of Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus says, to be my disciple, you must be willing to carry your cross. Are you willing to do that? Carrying the cross, thirdly, means that you have counted the cost. Jesus uses two par parables to prove his point. In verses 28 through 30, he talks about somebody who begins to build and doesn't finish the building project. Here's the idea. you got to make sure you have enough money before you begin a construction project. I've traveled throughout Latin America, as we've had the privilege to do, man, you see all kinds of houses that people began to build, but they ran out of money before they finished. And the unfinished house is a testimony to the fact that they ran out of money, but it's also a testimony to the fact that they didn't calculate the cost before they started. And so they began to build, but they never finished. You see, Jesus says, not counting the cost results in failure. In verses 31 through 32, he talks about an army of 10,000 coming against an army of 20,000. And he said, man, you would certainly sit down and evaluate your army's strength up against the strength of the opposing army before you ever went to battle. I'm certainly not a military strategist, but it would be unwise for a smaller army to make war against a larger one. The idea is this, measure up, count the cost, before you go in to battle. Here's what Jesus says, not counting the cost results in surrender. Now, now, now here's what Jesus is saying. Counting the cost, and he uses the phrase several times, counting the cost shows that salvation is not a flippant confession. Salvation is a serious decision. Have you counted the cost. Are you willing today to make a serious commitment for Jesus Christ? 
Jesus said to be my disciple, you've got to love me more than anybody else. To be my disciple, you've got to be willing to carry your cross. But he says a third thing. To be my disciple, you must be willing to give up everything you own. Notice verse 33. Not my words, Jesus's. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. I read these three statements, and it seems that, 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 that these statements get progressively more difficult. First, you've got to love Jesus more than your family. Secondly, you've got to be willing to suffer for him. Now he's asking us to give up everything for him. He says, unless you're willing to give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. Notice a couple of thoughts this demonstration of discipleship has the idea of relinquishing control. Relinquishing control. I give up my rights to all that I have. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying today. I'm not saying today that you got to go home, you got to put your house up for sale, you got to have a garage sale, sell everything you have and give all of it to God. That's not what Jesus is saying in the passage. If you want to do that, that's between you and God, but that's not what Jesus is saying in the passage. What Jesus is saying in the passage is this, that I give up my rights to all that I have. I give up my rights to my house, my possessions. Why? I give my rights to my kids up. I take my hands off of them, God. I realize that everything I am, God, everything I have is yours. As we sang, I give myself away. This demonstration of discipleship, secondly, has the idea of a willingness to lose everything. A willingness to lose everything. Several years ago, when Vicky and I were missionaries in Mexico, we took a trip out of the country, and we, we were staying a couple of days in Houston, Texas. It was quite a few years ago, because it was when Houston had, or it was actually when the Houston Oilers were still in. Some of the older football fans, you remember that. The Houston Oilers, which became the uh, Tennessee Titans, used to be in Houston. Well, the Houston Oilers were still there. And while we were in Houston, this scene was playing out. One of the offensive linemen for the Houston Oilers, his wife was expecting their very first baby. And it, and it just came to happen that the baby was scheduled to be born on a Sunday when the Houston Oilers were supposed to play a football game. And it uh, must have been a C-section or something because they scheduled it. And so all of a sudden, this football player was faced with a dilemma. Do I, do I play football, which is my job, or am I by my wife's side when she delivers her very first baby? Now, to complicate the situation just a little bit more, he went to his coach, he went to the officials of the Houston Oilers and asked permission, and they said, no, you can't miss the game. And as a matter of fact, if you miss the game, we're going to dock your pay for that one game. Now, for most of us, if we lose one day's pay, no big deal. For this football player, missing one game would cost him $120,000. A lot of money, It'd be a lot more in this day and age, but $120,000. So he was faced with a dilemma. Do I play football and not lose the money, or am I with my wife when our first baby's born and I lose $120,000? Well, we're watching all of this play out on the news, and the man decides to miss the football game, and he's at his wife's side when their first child is born. Sure enough, the Houston Oilers dock him $120,000. The um, news reporters picked up on it. And while we were there, the news reporters went out into the streets and began interviewing people, asking them, would you be willing to lose $120,000 to be at the birth of your very first child? And the response was varied. Some people said, that guy's crazy. I'd take the $120,000 and be there later on. Others said, no, it's so important for me to be there, I would lose all of it. Well, the question evolved until reporters were asking people, how much would you be willing to give up to be at the birth of your child? It was an interesting question. But back then, the question interested me from a spiritual point of view. Not how much I or you would be willing to give up to be at the birth of our child. How much would you be willing to give up 
to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If being a follower of Jesus Christ meant that you lost your job, are you still a follower of Jesus? If being a follower of Jesus meant that your family rejected you, are you still a follower of Jesus? If being a follower of Jesus meant that the bank seized all of your assets and in one day you lost absolutely everything, are you still a follower of Jesus? If being a follower of Jesus meant that you could lose your life, are you still a follower of Jesus? You see, here's what Jesus is saying. Man, to be a follower of mine there's, there's a price. Now, I'm not saying that salvation has a price. Salvation is by grace through faith. We get all of that. It's not of works lest any man should boast. But Jesus is saying, here's what I'm looking for in disciples. I'm looking for people that are willing to love me more than they love anyone else. I'm looking for people that are willing to carry their cross and follow me. I'm looking for people that are willing to give up everything to be my disciple. Here's the question that all of us answer in our lives. Is he worth it? Is Jesus worth giving up that much? Is he worth it? And that's the question that you and I answer each and every day in our lives, whether he is worth it or not let me just say you might sit back today and say man brian that's a depressing message that's a hard message i know it is but here's the key he's worth it amen Amen. he's worth it everything we sacrifice in this life is worth it if we could open up the curtain and we could look and see everything that God has for us, for all of eternity, for all of the future, we all would resoundedly say, it's worth it. He is worth it. Jesus is worth it. So let me ask you this morning, are you a follower or are you a fan? Do you cheer with the best of them? But your life just doesn't back up what you're saying. Jesus said, I didn't come to gain popularity. I came to make disciples. I didn't come to gain fans. I came to gain followers. What would happen if every member of Hollywood Community Church said, I'm gonna be all in. I'm gonna be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. It's amazing in countries that are being persecuted, Christianity is growing faster in countries that are being persecuted than it is in countries where we have the freedom like we have today. Why? Because it costs something to be a Christian. It costs something. Jesus said, If you love your father, mother, son, daughter, wife, brother, sister, football team more than me, you can't be my disciple. If you're not willing to carry your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. If you're not willing to give up everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. Are you a disciple? Are you a committed follower? Jesus Christ.